So in the news recently, partly because of Donald Trump's election, we have seen a lot of complaints about the proliferation of the so-called fake news. Mm -hmm. And you're someone who's done a lot of work in the political economy of communication. So I'm just curious, how would you explain both the rise of fake news, if you think it's a real problem, and also why the mainstream media, which some of us might think itself is full of a lot of lies and falsifications. Why is so obsessed with this problem? Okay, well, I, first of all, as your question already, uh, as you phrased it, surmises, uh, you know, uh, we have had fake news for 150 years. It's not a new development. The mainstream media, uh, my advisor, who is not as well known today as he should be, George Gerbner, used to say that the mainstream news is so highly selective that it might as well be fiction. He, he uh, used that expression. And so it's a question, in a way, of what you decide fake means. Um, but the mainstream news uh, system has been under threat, as we all know, in a very direct way through its advertising support structure for the last 10 years from the new media. And so they are looking for, I think, handholds of any sort to uh, retain their legitimacy. And this is one that uh, presented itself. Um, now, that said, I think that the standards of news manipulation that are being engaged in by the right wing in the United States uh, political establishment uh, do perhaps uh, uh, set a new benchmark for intervention and mystification and uh, efforts at uh, control. So all I'm suggesting here is that the people who are doing the name calling are not innocent. Uh, on the other hand, the situation that exists is also very frightening because the extent to which it has departed from any norms of rational critical discourse, a la Habermas and the public sphere, is uh, so extreme. Um, and I think, um, you know, that's really all that we need to say. That I don't think, well, you asked how come they're doing it. They're doing it for a, a directly uh, financial reason for themselves, I suppose, but also because there is a need to normalize, in a way, the discourse around Trump and the election of Trump. And so they're looking for bits of explanation that they can use as templates to help do that larger thing, to normalize the uh, Trump presidency. Um, and that uh, is what's going on. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I appreciate the most about your analysis and your historical work is how you manage to position the rise of digital capitalism uh, alongside the crisis that capitalism itself has encountered in the last 10, 20 or even more yeah, years, right. depending on what sort of perspective you take on. Can you say a few words about how you see this connection between digital firms and digital capitalism on the one hand, and the crisis that the economic model of capitalism yeah, yeah. itself has run into. Well, I'm not sure if I'll do a good job here, but the, uh, the point I would start with is that the process of digitization, which has occurred largely within capitalism, has been ongoing, recurrent, continual since the Second World War. It's not a new thing. It doesn't begin with the internet. And so each cycle, you could say, is a learning process of development. Uh, in the period uh, that is uh, between, let's say, the Reagan era and uh, the late 90s when we had the, the smaller financial crises of that time and then leading up to 2007, 2008, um, there was a massive assimilation of uh, that generation of networked systems and services which culminated with the assimilation of the internet. And all of that was part of uh, it was on the side of the ledger, you could say, that produced crisis. The information technology, the digital systems, were not part of the solution to crisis. They were embedded in it. And they were embedded in it, for example, in finance, where you could do, as we heard in today's discussion, more and more uh, elaborate and mysterious and opaque kinds of transactions uh, that, that uh, altered fundamentally, uh, even if you assume there were risk models, it completely threw them out the window. Um, but on the other hand, you could also say the same thing in the area of production, where the new systems were used to allow uh, new efficiencies, getting rid of labor, reorganizing, offshoring uh, of, of labor, outsourcing. All of these things were dependent on the networks. And this all fed into uh, what uh, 
uh, became a, uh, not just a financial crisis, but an economic crisis in 2008, 2009. Um, now, what about going forward? The issue there is, in a way, the same sort of issue it was before, and so I am implying here that there will be another crisis eventually, it may be sooner or maybe later. But the new systems, the current wave of internet denominated um, commodification projects, are um, very, very um, high profit areas for somebody. And so the scramble is on to try to uh, assimilate them quickly, to get anybody who's in the way of assimilating them quickly out of the way, by which I mean state authorities, for example, in many parts of the world who might um, put a cautionary sign on it, or oppositional social movements who might insist that there be some kind of technological sovereignty, or accountability, or privacy, or uh, jobs, any of those kinds of uh, concerns which motivate people all around the world. Um, and so I think at this point the hope, uh, and I think it's a legitimate one from within their own horizon, that all upstanding capitalists share is that they will be able to rescue and recuperate the system, modernize the system, if only these new commodification projects can be more fully, more extensively um, assimilated and, uh, and accepted. Uh, we were talking a little bit more about this in the context of the uh, uh, blockchain and uh, so forth downstairs a little while ago. But uh, whether they will be able to do this, because I think we stand at the uh, threshold of a wave of commodification whose scale and pace is so great that it will itself almost defy previous uh, experiences of, of this sign. And I think that anybody who thinks it's going to unroll, to unfold free of crisis at one point or another uh, in the process is uh, in a different planet. Mm -hmm. well, one of the slogans of neoliberal capitalism uh, has been free flow of capital. Right? So one of the goals of that project right. has been the removal of capital controls, liberalization of the exchange system, the destruction of the Bretton Woods architecture, and to some extent, um, some people argue that you know, free flow of data mm -hmm. has replaced that slogan as the sort of new goal of highly digitized neoliberal capitalism. And what I'm curious to know is how can movements that understand that ultimately free flow of data is the next stage of the free flow of capital. Uh, how can they fight this project without compromising their own ability to mobilize support about the need to fight for some kind of a universal online space where the traditional rules of capitalism no longer apply? The tension that I see, for example, is yeah, that yeah. anybody who would like to point out that you know, there is this capitalist need for the data to move freely is immediately dismissed by capitalists themselves as undermining this great freedom of the internet. On the other hand, uh, many of these movements themselves would like to appeal to that very internet <laughs> in order to push for net neutrality, uh, privacy, and so forth. So how can you see those two kind of contradicting forces being well, balanced? It's a, it's a complicated question, and I, you know, I think the first point is the one that almost uh, you begin with again uh, in your question, which is to distinguish between free flow of information as an official policy of the U.S. government that serves capital and the authentic and absolutely uh, basic needs of people all over the world for freedom of expression. Mm -hmm. This needs to be distinguished sharply. And societies need to have freedom of expression, and unfortunately most of them don't um, in different ways. But I, in other words, I think we need to begin by trying to delegitimize the slogan that is used, the free flow slogan. Uh, from the dominant holders. And I think we have one possible thing. Right now I'm looking for sources of hope. And one of them that I see is that the incoming administration in the United States, I'm not so certain that they will continue with this slogan because they're thinking very, I think, uh, uh, arrogantly and uh, crudely in many respects uh, about uh, the U.S. posture in the world and how to uh, restructure things to um, 
put it back in its central position. The free flow slogan has been a, an official policy of the United States since uh, 1945, and it was an ascendant policy starting in uh, the interwar period. So it has, you know, 80, 90 year development, which means it's very deep, and it will not go away easily. But I think there may be forces even within the establishment of the U.S. political structure which will begin to substitute a discourse of security for a discourse of free flow because that's where their own mindset goes. That's what they think. That's what they uh, prefer. So we'll see. But I think anything that we can do to differentiate the official policy slogan of free flow from the genuine baseline need for freedom of expression by individuals must be our initial line of um, attack for mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. I'd like to explore a little bit the geopolitical dimension to a lot of the struggles because clearly at this point, by and large, it's just the Russians and the Chinese, yeah, yeah. maybe with some interaction from the Brazilians and the Indians, who are trying to resist uh, the complete American takeover of their communications infrastructure, data networks, and so forth. Of course, historically, we know that sometime in the 70s and in the 80s, rooted partly in the non-aligned movement. I mean, there have been efforts yes. to also articulate an alternative vision for what an alternative communications and information regime might be. I'm just curious uh, to ask you this as a historian, how do you see any consistency maybe between those movements, but also what can we learn from the failure maybe yeah, of yeah. the previous effort uh, so many decades ago to try to fight this? Yeah, yeah. Well, it, you know, again, this is a very rich area to try to explore and we don't yet have full answers. So, for example, in the context uh, you ask about the new international information order movement, very few people remember that this existed. Um, it was the centerpiece of the delegitimization of mainstream research in social science um, in the 1970s and into the early 80s um, that took for granted prevailing power relations and had no interest in global redistribution. It was the, the, the basic point of departure for saying we need global redistribution, change to, from the bottom up of political economic structures, and that must include information, media, and communications. And that was the departure um, that was made by, by that movement at the time. So the first job is to recover some of that history. We know what it was as an international movement, but I have a doctoral student, for example, who's trying to trace it on the ground in Tanzania. Um, to see uh, what, if anything, was the result of buying into the movement for a new international information order, trying to resist cultural imperialism in East Africa, and in particular Tanzania, which was a regional leader of the movement under Nyerere um, at that time. So, and Latin America was in the forefront of, of this movement. So the same thing today. I'm sure that if we went to uh, Ecuador, if we went to Venezuela, if we went to a number of other, Brazil, it's a little different because it was military government back then, but um, if we went to some of the people who have been in, in the forefront of today's reform efforts, we would find some historical recognition, some on the ground knowledge of a continuity with the struggle for a new international information order. Um, and so that's a beginning point. What to do, what to learn from? Well, today the, the, the process of what used to be called communications, but now it's easier to talk in terms of information and uh, networks, um, has broadened to the point, in my opinion, that it is uh, coextensive with social reproduction. I mean, there's no longer uh, a sphere that you can point to and say, okay, here's television news, or here's uh, news agency dispatches coming over the wire service, or, you know, it's not a, a discrete sector so much as a generalized series, and ever more so, of networking processes across the length and breadth of the political economy. For this reason, in my view, a critique of um, the present unbalanced information order is essentially a critique of capitalism. It goes everywhere. And that, with that insight, we, I think, can arrive at analytical power that is relatively easy to translate into ordinary English. You don't have to say that this is some uh, really kind of far removed uh, 
uh, erudite discourse that only artists and intellectuals have. So the movement for a new international information order, there were a lot of artists, a lot of intellectuals, some statesmen um, who were involved, but it, it didn't have, I would say, uh, global popular traction, and that was its weakness. Today, it might be in principle easier to arrive at more traction because of the growing breadth of networking within the political economy and because of the range of issues that it touches that are not far away from people's experience, but just to the contrary, in the very center of their experience. All right, thank you very much. Thank you.